Thanks everyone for joining today's webinar uh, titled The Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa, Boosting Low Emission and Climate Resilient Infrastructure for Growing Cities. My name is Vanessa Vovor and I'm uh, advisor for the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so an initiative that you'll hear all about today. So we have a very dense program of one hour uh, that will start with a little icebreaker in the form of an interactive quiz um, on the impacts of climate change on Sub-Saharan African cities followed by a proper introduction and overview of the COMSA initiative provided by uh, the COMSA team leader at GIZ, Martin Baltes. And then we'll actually open the, the panel discussion with our panelists today. Um, we have Mr. Andrew Isam Gasnoller, who's research associate at the African Center for Cities, Mr. Jean-Alois Biwole, director of cooperation at FACOM, welcome. Uh, Engineer Festus Ngeno, who's about to join us in a few minutes, uh, who's Minister for Water, Environment, Energy and Natural Resources at the Nakuru County in Kenya. And finally, uh, our own Miss Shay, Shay O'Neill, Project Coordinator of the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so after that panel discussion, you will also have the opportunity to ask your questions to our panelists. So um, please feel free to already drop any of your thoughts or questions question in the chat um, and those will also be brought to my attention. Thank you and welcome to everyone. Um, so as I mentioned to start, uh, we have an interactive activity uh, in the form of a quiz. Um, so I actually will let my colleagues um, showcase the, the first question on the screen. So the first question for you, um, and you'll see that the different options will be put in the chat and you can just vote by putting a thumbs up on what you think is the right answer, is in 2019, what was the proportion of sub-Saharan African urban population with access to electricity? Re uh, answer A, 56%, B, 78%, or C, 95%. So, you can actually vote um, on the message that has been popped up that popped out in the chat. Um, so you can put a heart for the answer A, a thumbs up for the answer B, and finally um, a smiley face for answer C. So I'll, I'll let everyone take a, a minute to answer the chat. So. It seems like we have a majority of incorrect responses <laughs> because the answer was answer B, 78%. Thanks for playing the game. Second, out, out of the global, um, out of the global 384 billion US dollar, what is the average annual amount invested in sub-Saharan Africa and urban climate? Answer A, $3 billion, B, $13 billion, or C, $30 billion. I don't know. Thank you can again put it in the chat so the colleagues are putting in a chat and you can vote there. And indeed, I think here we have a majority of correct answers, uh, which is answer A, 3 billion US dollars. Third and last question, what proportion uh, of Mombasa, Kenya will be submerged by a sea level rise of 30 centimeters, uh, I guess by, by 2050, uh, if we follow a business uh, as usual scenario? So the question is put in the chat. And I'll let you answer. Good. And it's actually answer B, 
seven, seven, 17%. Um, so I think just this, this is just, this was just a quest to also uh, keep you on your toes um, and kind of break the ice, but also to highlight the importance of the global phenomenon of climate change and how it is also impacting life in cities um, in different aspects, be it infrastructure, housing, health or livelihoods. Um, and But at the same time, cities can be key actors to actually fight climate change. Um, even if only 4% of global GHG emission originate in Africa, the continent has, identified, um, um, has been identified as one of the part of the world that is the most vulnerable and exposed to the impacts of climate change. Um, as, uh, as I said, uh, it's affecting uh, several aspects of life, um, especially in the context uh, of a city or urban context. With an additional 1 billion people living in African cities by 2050, this will only continue to be a major challenge. And so, therefore, it is very essential to get African cities and local governments fully involved in the fight against climate change and the improvement of access to sustainable energy. It is important to adopt a coordinated approach and action both at the national and local level to achieve these goals. Um, many cities and local governments are already uh, taking those efforts um, uh, towards renewable energy, cleaner production techniques and regulations or incentives that actually um, allow them to uh, mitigate uh, as well as adapt to climate change. Uh, however, there's still a lot remaining, uh, especially when it comes to unlocking finance for local government projects. Um, and for this, uh, the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa initiative uh, comes right in to support um, City in that endeavor. So as you heard that this initiative is at the core of our uh, discussion today, um, I would like to give the floor now to Martin Baltes, who's the team leader uh, of the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa here at GIZ, to introduce us to um, the Covenant of Mayors uh, and give us an overview of the project. Thank you, Martin. Thanks very much, uh, Vanessa. Um, and thanks very much to the uh, GIZ organizers of Urban October. Um, um, thanks very much for having us here. Um, myself, I'm GIZ, so uh, Vanessa is also GIZ, working in the in the GIZ and my team. We are um, a support unit um, um, implementing implemented by GIZ in part uh, and uh, supporting the uh, the initiative, um, the Covenant of Mayors Sub-Saharan Africa which is an initiative that is much larger. Um, so um, to give you a rough idea of what COMSA and the global agenda looks like, the Covenant of Mayors um, Sub-Saharan Africa is part of the global Covenant of Mayors, um, the largest, which is the largest global network um, of cities and um, municipalities taking climate action. Um, today, we have over 10,000 signatories worldwide, and we have um, in sub Sahara we have um, slightly under 300, which um, is, um, it, as a coincidence, corresponds pretty much to the 3% of the greenhouse gas emissions stemming from, from Africa. So it's uh, also 3% uh, signatory uh, number. But we're still counting, and there are more and more cities joining the initiative because um, they see the benefit of um, of its activity. And um, I think part of what we are trying to show today um, with the practitioners that we'll have, um, that we will see in the panel discussion later, uh, we hope to to convince um, yeah, even more um, contributors to actually join this initiative. Um, COMSA is part of the, of the EU's Green Deal, supporting the African Union Agenda 2063 as well as BMZ Agenda 2030, because BMZ is one of the co-financiers um, of this initiative, as well as uh, ESSET, the Spanish corporation. Um, COMSA is uh, committed to the Paris Climate Agreement, of course, and contributes uh, to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, especially, of course, uh, SDG 11, 7, and 13. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, go to the next slide again and then go back to this one, please. 
Yes. So it's a regional uh, Team Europe uh, initiative. I think this is this is important. Um, it's thanks to the uh, especially to the funding of the EU um, was 20, uh, 27.5 million in the current phase, and we're already in phase three. Um, that um, the EU, especially, but also the co-funding from Germany, from the German and the Spanish government, um, allow for um, for this activity. Um, as Vanessa already mentioned, um, cities uh, play a very big role in greenhouse gas emissions and in the vulnerability as well. They are very vulnerable, um, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where we were expecting uh, tremendous growth uh, in city population. Um, we're talking about uh, doubling and tripling uh, between now and 2050. So there's um, there's a lot of work to do, especially in planning. And then um, what I was hearing, listening in on the um, on a talk by uh, the mayor of Freetown. So um, she was saying uh, one of the big um, big topics about migration from the rural areas into the cities um, are the informal settlements. And in order to cope with the situations you have there, be it security, be it wash, be it uh, energy, housing, um, it has to do with planning. We have to get planning, um, you have to get planning, urban planning um, on top of the agenda. And um, that's what we are, what we're doing in this initiative. Um, as you can see, um, as an implementer, we are currently uh, four agencies implementing ourselves, GIZ, uh, and um, and Asset, also co-financing, but also our friends from France uh, with AFD and Expertise France. Um, we're covering uh, a lot of the African countries um, with deep dive support um, in roughly one third of the countries. Uh, there's still room, so um, I think the initiative would be would be glad to to open to more. Uh, to more support. So if you now go back to the uh, through the previous slide, please. Um, here you can see the three pillars of our activity. Um, we're developing um, strategic documents, so-called CCAPs, Sustainable Energy Access and Climate Action Plans, together with the municipalities. Um, they're sort of the NDCs on a um, on a spatial level um, um, for for these municipalities. And they give us then guidance um, to um, because they prioritize according to the to the real city needs um, what will be done in the urban infrastructure uh, for which we then uh, provide project support. So we will um, we will see that the, the the potential projects, be it in in transport, be it in electricity, be it in in housing or whatever. Um, get to the level of uh, sufficient documentation so that we then can um, take them to potential funders and, and see that these projects um, get built and, and operated. And the third pillar is the city to city regional partnerships. This is uh, mainly um, uh, a peer to peer um, possibility of exchange of lessons learned of uh, of best practices of the sitting signatory cities where the exchange and um, also there's uh, it's not limited to the peer to peer exchange. It's also um, possible to have um, partnerships within the entire network of the GCOM. So uh, countries from all over the globe um, that have specific uh, competencies in some areas of infrastructure and willing to, to support the, the infrastructure development in Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm very much looking forward to the exchange, especially with our guests and the panel. And with this, um, I would like to hand over back to Vanessa. And thanks and um, talk to you later. Thank you very much, Martin, for um, the context and all the details about our initiative. So I think now everybody also understands better the framework within which we work and the importance of this thematic as part of the initiative that we are leading. 
I'd like to open the panel now and welcome our first panelist, um, which is Mr. Andrew Hisan Gasnolar, whose research associates at the African Center for Cities. The African Center for Cities is an interdisciplinary hub at the University of Cape Town, mandated to conduct research on how to understand, recast, and address pressing urban crises. So thank you for being with us, Andrew. Um, and maybe my first question for you to uh, provide us with a little bit of background and landscape of what's at stake now is what does it what does it mean for African cities um, to be paving the way for sustainability? Um, so do you have examples maybe to share with us on the role of cities when it comes to fighting climate change um, and improving access to sustainable energy? Thank you. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Um, good morning to everyone joining us uh, this morning. I think, you know, Martin, and I think our icebreaker has kind of set the scene of, of what we're wrestling with and particularly what the Global South is wrestling with. And I think there's a number of examples across the continent um, of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, so particularly issues of sanitation, mobility, urban infrastructure, but a lot of these happen at the cityscape. And I think it requires both a political will, but also the necessary planning, budgeting, and fiscal availability of resources. And so you see projects in Vintuk and Lusaka that have been able to use issues of sustainable interventions on sanitation, water re reclamation projects, which has been able to sort of proof those regions and those cities from droughts that is becoming more and more um, prone across the region. Um, in issues of mobility, what you're now beginning to see is you're beginning to see mobile solutions that are looking at using tech, but also using things like green energy, right? So you have rail um, operators both in East Africa as well as in South Africa, the hard train that are in the process of looking at how do we make our rail infrastructure green? How do we power that by electric? But over and beyond kind of the infrastructure of your powertrain, what they are looking at is the charging infrastructure. Because there's no point using electricity from coal-based power stations to power your electric chains. And what we're seeing is an intervention um, and investments um, in the tens of millions of euros looking at piloting those solutions, both in places like Ghana and South Africa, looking at rail infrastructure particularly. Uh, but I think the important element is also around paratransit, and you see a number of multilateral organizations working with cities in piloting bus commuter transport, but also looking at the paratransit role of what, the, what we commonly call border borders or minibus taxis across the continent and actually piloting the retrofitting of those taxis to become electric vehicles. And again, looking at the type of infrastructure you need from a public transport interchange. Uh, but I think what we, we are lagging behind is that massive investment required in urban regeneration to confront issues of climate change, right? Um, and it touches across issues of sanitation, housing, and capacity to make those changes. And I think interventions like um, this particular covenant and others globally is quite helpful in sharing lessons so that lessons of Vintu can be shared in Cape Town, but similarly lessons of Accra can be shared in Lusaka. And then lessons from you know, the global north can also be onboarded and localized in our context. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, this context. And maybe a follow-up question is around what was also introduced by, by Martin earlier, the importance of multi-level governance, um, but also of peer-to-peer -peer exchange between, um, between local governments and cities, and how can that be fostered uh, to accelerate the transition of cities towards uh, more sustainable models? I would also be interested in, in hearing about how your research has covered that. Sure. No, thanks, Vanessa. I think, I mean, I think the, the benefit of mainstreaming climate change in our context has been that it's directly and indirectly affected some of our developmental challenges. So it's assist us in considering how do we consider local participation? How do we look at issues of just transition? How do we look at the creation of green jobs in countries with um, abject poverty and unemployment rates? And you see this in places from Durban to Lusaka to Accra to Cairo where we're able to take these lessons where many of our socioeconomic challenges are very similar. We have similar issues, uh, confronting issues of urban ecosystems and similar socio-environmental, but also political dynamics. And I think the, the best practice that we have been able to foster across the region is the city-to-city -city learning. 
which I think is both the development and sharing of good practices, knowledge, experiences, but also the benefit of specific transdisciplinary research across the region, which has been able to kind of confront issues of climate variability, issues of sanitation, extreme climate events, but then also more traditional events such as, you know, the burgeoning um, urban population and how to confront human settlements and the urban poor in those cities. And I think those lessons have motivated many cities to facilitate exchanges. But I think what we do need, as you've highlighted, and I think this covenant highlights, is the need for an accelerated commitment for those lessons to be shared and a more structured way for best practice to be honed and then particularly piloted in specific cities because the urban landscape is where we can best confront these issues in a very agile way as opposed to just informing national policy and I think you know most citizens across the continent the interaction they receive directly from their cities is often the most closest to them but also in many ways it's where you are able to shift from a green economy perspective you are able to shift your energy grid, you are able to make shifts in sanitation as well as transport planning in the immediate term. It's not sort of 30 year horizons. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you very much, Andrew, for, for this. And I think, yeah, it's it's very crucial to also uh, highlight the fact that as Covenant, the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa is really part of the core work. It's really a network of local governments uh, on the African continent, a network of over 250 local governments. And so that knowledge exchange is also happening within, within the network. So thank you. Um, I'd like now to welcome our second panelist, um, Mr. Jean-Aloïs Biwole, Director of Cooperation at FECOM. Uh, Jean, Mr. Jean Alois is an architect and urban planner by training, but also the director of cooperation um, at FECOM, which, which is the uh, responsible, which is responsible for the financing uh, of communal and intercommunal investment works uh, in Cameroon. Um, so, welcome, Mr. Mr. Jean Joël, uh, Jean Alois. Um, well, my well. first question for you would be. Um, what is? Can you explain us a little bit further on what is the role um, of an agency like FACOM and how uh, a collaboration uh, with the initiative of the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa in Cameroon um, has actually been supporting a lot of activities in cities like Yaoundé, Gawa, uh, Douala, etc. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be with you this morning. Sorry for my English because I'm not uh, very fluent and I will try to give you uh, the, the most uh, information I can. Um, FECOM is a public institution. We work with uh, local authorities uh, from 40 years uh, or maybe 1974. And uh, we used to, to work with uh, local authorities in Cameroon uh, for the investment, for, for, to help uh, local authorities to invest uh, in uh, different uh, projects, uh, basic services, uh, like water, energy, and a lot of things, uh, all of the things that the, the local authorities can ask uh, and uh, we we give we give uh, maybe some uh, loans and uh, non uh, 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 non reimbursable funds uh, equally, and uh, we we help the local authorities to prepare the projects uh, to have uh, to, a durable sustainable uh, uh, projects uh, in the different. Uh, councils around the, the Cameroon. Then in Cameroon we have uh, 370 uh, councils and this council needs the means to 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 live, um, to, to pay the, the salaries, but they need uh, uh, funds to invest in, in different uh, uh, ways and uh, fight against uh, Climate change is now a very big challenge for them, and we try to help them. Then now, uh, maybe from one year, we have uh, uh, we we sign a convention with uh, uh, Comsa, and uh, we had uh, three main uh, 
uh, trainings with uh, with maybe around 40 uh, uh, councils uh, around the, the, the around country. The... Yes, and um, uh, we we work uh, on uh, energy uh, public lightings. Uh, in uh, February, we had uh, a, a training uh, with uh, about uh, portable water on uh, August, and now we are preparing a training uh, about waste management in next November. Then it's uh, very important for us to to help to to help local authorities to understand uh, to make the link between uh, essential services. And uh, the, the the question of uh, clim climate change, and uh, maybe to help them to integrate the question of uh, fighting against against uh, climate change in all of the projects they can have. Uh, then um, we can say that uh, FECOM uh, equally uh, signed a convention with the FAO uh, for uh, readiness to. Uh, to access to the green climate fund and uh, we can say that we we, we try to have uh, many uh, partners uh, to 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 fight uh, to fight again uh, climate change then sorry for my english but uh, uh, i can give you the, i can give you the information uh, when you will need it. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, and your English was very good and uh, very clear to everyone. Do not worry. Um, maybe a follow up question. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about some of your successes. Um, you mentioned those uh, uh, COMSA supported activities and training around specific sectors. Um, can you tell us more about what were the needs in terms of building the capacities that these training responded to? And potentially, how does that fit into the larger conversation that FACOM is having with the national level as well uh, in terms of raising awareness of what um, are the needs of, of local governments when it comes to financing their projects. Uh, okay, if I well understand, I can say that uh, uh, for many years we work uh, on uh, essential services uh, for local authorities, the question of water, the question of uh, energy, how to bring energy in um, some rural areas, because in the cities we have uh, the energy and we have uh, public services for it, but in some places you have no possibility to have uh, energy. But in Cameroon, you know, it's a country with a very big potential, uh, water potential, and we can have uh, clean energy with uh, um, uh, hydraulic uh, uh, potential and then uh, we have the possibility uh, in the, the south uh, uh, part of the, 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 the country uh, to have uh, some solution with hydraulic but in the, the north of uh, Cameroon uh, uh, we have the possibility of uh, solar uh, energy uh, to help population to 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 have the electricity. Then, with the local authority, we have uh, also a big asking for public lighting, uh, because when you have the the energy is uh, cutted in the big cities, uh, when you have public light, you can see uh, uh, pupils. Uh, who go who, who guns out uh, outside uh, to to read the the book to uh, learn uh, on the the public lights and it's uh, uh, you you have a uh, new activities around this public light uh, facilities in the cities where the the mayor asked for it then in fecom we we make a lot in this um, way uh, to to invest in public lights, but uh, at the moment we need uh, more possibilities uh, for financing uh, public lights, and we have uh, also the needs to 
for the, the local authorities to well understand the link with uh, the fight against climate change, then it's better for them to have a solar solution for public lighting than uh, to maybe uh, already use uh, a public uh, system uh, with, with not uh, able to give them uh, energy uh, for long of our durable of our uh, without cutting, if I, if you understand well, and uh, we have also the the solution of um, of the potable water uh, was uh, very important because uh, you have some places with uh, dr with uh, uh, um, uh, saison des pluies. Uh, with uh, the, sorry, uh, with a very important raining season, but you are in this place. You have water, you have uh, raining, but you have not potable water, and it's a problem for people who are already uh, obliged uh, when the, the the children are, comment dire, sont malades, sont when when uh, when children uh, get sick. Uh, to 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 bring more money for families to to go to to the hospital then to invest for uh, every day or for investment for the family. Uh, so what can I say? Uh, that is very important for local authorities, and that what the, the possibility bring with the Comsa. Uh, to help us uh, to train a mayor, uh, not only the mayors, the political one, but the, the, the people who make the project in the, the local authorities, the people who uh, try to, to work with the, the, the population, uh, uh, the people who bring or uh, who uh, exploit maybe or manage local services, uh, to make the link be between the the climate the the, the fight the, the fight against uh, climate change and the essential services, but also uh, for the income generating projects because uh, you know that we we can have income uh, generating projects uh, will help to to fight against uh, climate change. Then uh, we can say that. Uh, Comsa help us to to give uh, more information in this way how to 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 how to fight against climate change and uh, without uh, leaving some some project because we we have the the fights against climate change in all the projects we can have but we have to understand how we have to uh, to prepare these projects how we have to study it uh, for uh, a best impact on the population and uh, the, the, the way of uh, living. Uh, sorry, I don't know if I give you... Uh, I, I give you... Um, yeah, that was, yeah, that was very, <laughs> yeah, I think you answered all my questions and I think uh, thank you again for also reminding us of how the importance of uh, getting climate finance for projects uh, has a direct impact on the daily lives, a uh, very concrete impact on the daily lives of the citizens of those cities. So thanks again also for, for that context. Uh, and we're, we're very, ha very happy to have you with us as a key partner in Cameroon, which is one of the countries where we have the most signatories as well. So uh, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, I'd like to welcome now our next panelist, uh, Engineer Festius Ngeno, Minister of Water, Environment, Energy and Natural Resources at the Nakuru County in Kenya. Um, so if you're with us, Engineer Festius, maybe if you can turn on your camera if it's possible. Yeah, I'm with you, but I'm on the road. So <laughs> okay. I'm not able to turn on my camera. 
Okay, mm -hmm. then no, no issue. We'll, we'll, ju we'll just listen to you. Maybe um, we can start by uh, offering you the possibility to introduce the uh, how Nakuru County is working with the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa and what you have managed to achieve so far um, when it comes to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vanessa and uh, uh, my colleague panelists on, the, on this uh, program. So for us as an uh, Nakuru County, we are grateful that we were able to and, and therefore that Nakuru, what, what, what we've been able to do so far is that we've been able to put uh, considerable commitments towards a more sustainable uh, future in terms of climate change finance, uh, financing. So one of the key things that we've been able to do uh, in Akuru uh, through the support of Governor Omeas is one, uh, the implementation of uh, our Nakuru Climate Change Action Plan, which is uh, uh, giving us a strategy, uh, giving us a policy direction on what we needed to do. So the, the Nakuru Climate uh, Change Action Plan has various components that touches on the various pertinent uh, programs that we are, uh, are currently implementing. And out of the climate uh, Nakuru County Climate Change Action Plan, which was approved, we've been able to uh, again go further to have our climate uh, uh, change uh, bill approved in 2020. So we are calling it Nakuru County Climate Change Bill. 2020, and out of that, uh, it has been it has been it has opened up a lot of opportunities for us in terms of assessing even the climate change finance uh, for mitigation adaptation uh, programs. And as we speak now, there is a program that we are currently pursuing, where one of the key things that we were able to do uh, in terms of when when the bill was approved is to secure some financing. We are calling it um, climate change finance which uh, the, in terms of our appropriation of fine funding, we have appropriated 1% of our of our, uh, our development expenditure as a county for us to be able to make, um, uh, to implement climate change programs within the county. Uh, and uh, lucky enough, again, uh, Governor Nomeas supported us through the press, uh, pro, uh, process. And currently, thirdly, uh, what we are uh, working on now is our county energy plan uh, through the support of Governor Omeas and GIZ, and we are really uh, appreciative. Now, the, the, all these things are, are tied up under the, the SICA program, which is a, a, a program that is for sustainable energy assets and climate action plan. So as we were signing up in the year 2020, we, we it really gave, gave us an opportunity to put these uh, programs and documents together for purposes of us uh, progressing our climate change uh, programs within the county. The climate change action plan, climate change bill, then now the county uh, uh, energy plan, which we which is underway as we speak. Uh, and three, two other uh, uh, bills that came, which are so related at the same time, that were approved together at the same time with the climate change uh, bill 2020, is also the water, the Nakuru County Water and Sanitation Bill. Uh, I had my colleague, uh, my, my uh, panelist Martin mentioning about the water sanitation uh, 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 access within the, the region. So we have a water and sanitation bill 2020, which ties closely on what the climate change bill uh, does. So that, that, that's a critical uh, framework that we've been able to, to put in place. And uh, lastly, again, we have the Solid Waste Management Bill 2020 tied again to climate change. So all these things, uh, as we were looking at our sanitation, no, we cannot... Uh, ...in perspective or looking at the solid waste management. So the... Uh, as we are looking at that, then we've been able to really uh, progress our di our discussion, and Com Comsa has been able to help us as we are putting the frameworks together in capacity building issues, sensitization, climate mainstreaming within the ministries. We have around ten ministries, and we have climate change uh, champions in all the ministries that focuses on on what we are doing. Uh, we have even during the CCAP development process, it was participatory, and uh, with all the county staff, national government staff. CBOs, 
And uh, even on the energy planning. And of course, lastly, to mention is a regional exchange within our cities on best practices. Uh, being aware that on the energy planning, we are participating in around three, uh, three, three uh, cities, Nakuru or counties, Nakuru, Kisumu and Mombasa. So those exchanges have been forthcoming within our, our realm. Thank you Thank very you. much and congratulations again to Nakuru for being the climate change champion. Um, so maybe just to follow up on, on your last point, I would be curious to know more on how this cooperation with uh, other stakeholders, you mentioned participatory processes, uh, engagement yeah. with the national level and civil society, how has that been taking place and how has that um, helped to strengthen your, uh, your climate and energy action plan and, and other activities? Thank you so much. So, so for us, uh, and, and I think this is, uh, and in Kenya, you know, we are coming from the national perspective, the national government, you know, we have two levels of government in Kenya, the national and the sub level, and the, and the sub national, which are, we are calling them counties. The, there is the 20, uh, the Cl Kenya Climate Change Act was, uh, was, simply, was uh, enacted in 2016, but cascading it to the counties has taken quite a number of uh, years. And therefore, the year 2020 to 2021 has been uh, what I could call it um, a, a, a bliss in terms of us understanding what what, what climate change uh, is all about. And therefore, then in the participatory uh, framework that I mentioned, collaboration, whether formal or informal, with the various stakeholders, one is that we we have been able to create. And so the the the, the participatory process, we have been able to create a platform for exchange and. Uh, between national and some national organs of governance. One thing that you need to understand uh, and uh, for us is that we, 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 for us to be able to cascade or mainstream our Nakuru, for example, county energy bill and, and act uh, 2020, we are, uh, it has to draw uh, the, the, we have to draw it from the national or the overarching national law, which is the Kenya Climate Change Act 2016. And therefore, then as we were implementing, we needed to have the organs of governance in place. And that is where participatory process came, came in. Two is that uh, even in the, in, in the energy planning and the, our, our climate change, we, 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 uh, even as we implement even the county energy plan currently, that is underway and uh, we appreciate your support, is that we there is also the uh, uh, national energy plan and act 2019 so we are cascading it to the sub nationals to the level so we, we, it, because we are the people on the ground we are implementing these programs with within our regions and in the communities we have to cascade we have to mainstream we have to contextualize uh, the programs on the ground so we we have that collaboration with the Minister of Energy with the National Government Agency and bringing it together uh, other stakeholders within the same platform. Uh, and then uh, thirdly also we have what we are calling city to city exchanges as I did mention that the other counties for example in Kenya have come to to benchmark in our county and I'll give you an example of Embu County uh, which uh, we were able to really help them join you know, we were among the first one to join Comsa. So Embuko uh, joined Comsa also following the successful works in Akuru County uh, between, uh, uh, they came and see what we've been able to do. And of course, we have various exchanges, as I mentioned, between Akuru, Mombasa, and Makwenyu on matters of climate change. So the exchanges have been very, very uh, uh, effective, county to county or city to city. Uh, and so uh, that has been great. La lastly, to mention that, um, uh, as joining Comsa as a signatory and committing to develop a CICAP, you know, it was a process uh, uh, and, and it took us almost one year for us to get all the instruments in place and to be admitted into Comsa. Uh, it, it, helped, it has helped us as Nakuru and even participating even now uh, among the uh, growing network of over, two, uh, over 200 cities and some national governments from over 35 countries. It is giving us a lot of um, uh, leverage. We are we are a benchmark. We are a, we are a county in Nakuru among the 47 counties in Kenya. And anything that when we talk about um, uh, climate change uh, programs, we, are, we, we become the, the, the foot all. We become the people that will be able to show the others the process. And you see, our process have been very, very participatory. Uh, you, you note that even as we become, we are going to be the fourth city 
we we just waiting to be a, a charter. Even other counties who want to visit is also come to Penjbak in Nakuru. Even on sanitation matters, we we are Penjbak, we are we are leader in, in the sector on that front. So it has given us a very uh, a, can I call it high level profile in participation, and we appreciate. Uh, uh, we don't regret having joined Comsa. We we really appreciative of the process. Thank you. Thank you so much for those elements that I think are, are really embody the, the core of our initiative from the perspective of a local government. So thank you for being with us and sharing um, your insights. Um, I'd like thank now you. to give the floor to Shay O'Neill. Shay is responsible for the coordination uh, of the implementation of the COMSA initiative through the other uh, at different MSOs, so member state organization. As you may know, the Covenant of Mayors in Sub-Saharan Africa is co-funded by the European Union and the BNZ, but co-implemented by three, uh, by four uh, member states organization. Uh, so not only the GIZ, but also AFD, ACID, um, and Expertise France. And so Shay, my question for you would be, um, since COMSA is the real Team Europe initiative, um, how are the different member state organizations working together to implement those activities and um, how are we ensuring that this collaborative work really serves the signatory cities? Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. And thanks for also introducing um, some of the MSOs as well and I'll also be using that term a lot, um, MSO for member state organization and happy to be here representing the four that you just mentioned. Um, these four MSOs are working in a number of different countries, and we've also been lucky enough to hear from a few different examples, specifically uh, in some of the countries, which is great. And they're focused on three different priorities. So uh, developing the sustainable energy and access, uh, sustainable energy access and climate action plans, project implementation, and then the cooperation and knowledge exchange between cities. And it's nice that we've also had a chance to hear some of the, the examples um, from Nakuru just now uh, about these different aspects. And so the approach of the MSOs uh, varies between MSO and how they work, but also um, between cities, just depending on uh, the different relationships that they have with the cities on the ground and what works best uh, based on the priorities uh, that the cities have identified. So many different approaches. And the great thing about that is that all of the MSOs also have the opportunity to share these different approaches uh, very frequently with each other and exchange on what's working and what's not, uh, best practices, um, some technical deep dives on, on certain projects, and also be able to replicate some of the examples that are working throughout the region, which is really great. Um, it's a really collaborative approach between the MSOs. And uh, they're currently working on around 20 projects right now, implementing those projects, and then close to completing almost 10 uh, sustainable energy access and climate action plans. Um, and through through these projects, it's proje projected that the climate financing to be unlocked uh, is over 180 million euros right now. And so my role in the project coordination unit um, is really to make sure that all of the MSOs are coordinating and also with our funders, the European Commission and BMZ and um, ISC as well and working well together also with the cities on the ground. And I think we've really developed a great network between the MSOs, uh, the signatory cities and uh, the funders, and we'll continue to have this collaborative approach as we continue to implement the project. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I thought I was on mute. Thank you very much, Shay, for, for um, this introduction to also the important framework uh, within which we are working on the Covenant of Mayors, which is not only us, but this collaborative approach um, that really embodies this uh, vision of a Team Europe initiative. So thank you for giving us and providing us with this context. Um, I'd like now to open the floor for questions. We still have 10 minutes. Um, so maybe if um, some of the, the attendees would like to uh, raise their question themselves, so feel free to raise your hand and um, turn on your camera. Um, otherwise, you can always pop it in the chat. Um, now it's your time, so please go ahead.
Okay, I see. I don't see any hand raised, so maybe I'll just go on with some of the further questions I was also asking myself, um, actually. So maybe um, a perspective first from the African Cities, uh, Center for Cities, Andrew. I would also be again curious to um, have your take on how can local governments um, um, get further into uh, the political space to make their climate policies more ambitious um, in terms of the, the the advocacy work that cities are doing. We are just a few days ahead of COP26. Um, maybe to have also a perspective on uh, what has been uh, some of the successes or uh, still challenges for cities to advocate in such a big fora um, when it comes to, 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 to local governments. Thanks. Um, thanks, Vanessa. I mean, I think the the obvious one is obviously access to resources, right? And I think I think what cities often struggle with is how do they confront issues of urban sprawl? How do they reduce inequities? How do they support the urban poor? But then also, how do they begin to favor shifts towards public transport to different modes of transport, different resourcing? And I think the the big challenge is often cities are, are at the back end of of you know the interest within a big forum like COP26, which is obviously a very geopolitical kind of sovereign country-driven agenda. But I think what cities can begin to do is to highlight the um, agility of cities to really introduce um, sort of climate change oriented solutions, whether it's on transport, traditional infrastructure, sanitation, water reclamation, and also climate change adaption. And I think, you know, the city's ability to share city to city knowledge and pilot projects has the benefit of capturing the imagination, right? And I think the cities can begin to kind of highlight the interventions that are reducing kind of the urban poor landscape within that urban sprawl agenda by really introducing meaningful housing policies. Um, highlighting the kind of basic services for all that it's introducing, which touches on everything from sanitation to electricity, and then also how it's able to reduce its energy dependence on coal-based um, coal power. And we're seeing a lot of cities across sub-Saharan Africa begin to introduce that, and starting with, you know, where does it get its energy off, what energy grid and what power base is that um, energy coming from. And we're beginning to see cities kind of model and say 30% of our energy by within the next five years needs to be sourced from renewable energy. And you're beginning to create a climate where new alternative energy uh, producers are now being able to cater not just for the, you know, the red tape of a national government, but the city landscape. And I think that's a that's an important lesson that we can begin to share. Um, and, it, it, you know, you can replicate it from electricity, but you can also take it into issues of transport, mobility, um, non-motorized transport, and also the introduction of greener solutions across the board. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I also noted from the chat um, a message and maybe an invitation to dive a bit further on the uh, financial investment topic from Vincent Kitio, who is very familiar with the initiative as well, especially in Cameroon. Um, so I will read his message that, that says, thanks to the panelists for the informative participation. A lot of progress being uh, has been made in the implementation of this big network of uh, mayors, um, uh, but also specifically on building capacities of local leaders on key urban basic services and planning and policies. I would like to hear more on financial investments on urban energies and climate uh, action intervention. So maybe this one for, for Martin, um, actually, is because indeed the covenant of, of mayors um, has been uh, in this first phase now, um, the, the initial ones being focusing more on the climate planning aspect uh, and the third thing uh, focusing ad in addition to that on unlocking climate finance for local governments so maybe your take on and maybe some indeed updates to uh, to to those who have been following the initiative in this early stage um, on how this part of the work this pillar of a work is still uh, also progressing um yeah thanks Vanessa so I think um um, as earlier on, we um, we mentioned that um, what we're doing is we're looking at the um, we're looking at the priorities of the uh, of the municipalities uh, together with them. So we're not uh, we hope that we're not bringing any uh, alien uh, agenda to the 
to the already full tables, right? Uh, so to their planning. So, but um, we're basically agnostic on where the focus is going to be on mitigation or adaptation. But uh, when you're talking about renewable energy, I think um, the, uh, the the big advantage then on the mitigation side um, is um, that the economic um, underlying dynamics very straightforward in, in renewable energy today um, with the um, cost for especially um, solar um, uh, decentralized solar electricity are um, coming down and the um, and basically the um, the um, yeah the the radiation as well as the um, as the potential sites uh, in these municipalities are are available and and really um, um, easy to develop. So there we do have a base a base case where um, we usually not in all uh, configurations but in most of them uh, we can produce um, electricity cheaper via solar than with any other means. So be it coal or be it especially for the case in Nigeria where we have um, um, where we have um, uh, um, a lot of diesel um, diesel combustion running um, along with the with the grid. So we do have we do have uh, particular cases per per um, per country and per per village and per city, but basically we do have a, a case that works. And I think here. Um, um, what what is the, the the big advantage for the smaller projects that we do have also a number of sites that are under the control of the city uh, of the municipal uh, governance, so um, they can develop some of the um, uh, to some extent uh, in the several megawatt size even projects um, where they can then bring down the costs that they're already incurring today. Um, so there's a there's a big opportunity, and for this, I think funding funding will be available. And uh, it's of course always the bigger the project is, the more you have to liaise with uh, other levels of government, and um, and the less secure the the underlying um, positive delta of um, of avoided cost is uh, in the um, in the uh, in the technical um, layout. The more it gets difficult, but with uh, especially with solar and with um, with the potential on um, on municipal um, uh, sites, I think there's a big chance to to really um, bring down costs and uh, better the um, the the climate in the city. Of course, uh, you know it's uh, sometimes it has to do with noise, with the combustion uh, systems that we have. Um, with the with the quality of air, and of course, in the in the larger scale, it also um, reduces the um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you for those additional information. And um, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, all the panelists and all the attendees for all their very good questions and intervention. I think this session was uh, just a, an in, a introduction or a teaser to the work that actually uh, the Covenant of Mayors is doing. So I highly encourage you to uh, get in touch with us if you want to know more, if you want to follow up on some of the aspects that we touched upon today. Um, as you've heard, this is a large initiative. We cover uh, um, not only the capacity building side of, of developing climate and energy uh, action at the local level, but also how to finance those local projects, how to build those partnerships with the key stakeholders um, within the country at the national level, regional level, but also with civil society. And on a broader scale, how do we encourage those city to city cooperation and animate this network while still um, while still also uh, doing all of this uh, in a Team Europe initiative. So sharing those lessons with other member states organization, um, lots of opportunities to, to learn from each other. So if you want to know more, please visit our website, uh, um, get in touch with us. Um, and again, thank you very much to all of our panelists for taking the time to be with, her, with us today and, um, and wish you all a, a very good day. Thank you to also GIZ Urban October team and the whole organizi organizing team. Bye. Bye, thanks Vanessa for thank you. Thanks everybody for joining us. Bye, thanks Vanessa. Thank you, bye. bye. Thank you, bye.